Hophni, the servant of Elisha, a man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman the Aramean by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chair to meet him. Is everything all right? He asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take the two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up the two talents of silver and two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them two of his servants. He gave them two, two of his servants, and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away, and they left. Then he went and stood before his master, Elisha. Where have you been, Gehazi, he asked. Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said, It was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you. Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes, olive groves, vineyards, flocks, herds, men servants and maid servants? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence, and he was leprous, as white as snow. May God add a blessing to the reading from 2 Kings here this morning. You know, when you start to think about it, there's really no calling on earth that doesn't have its own set of hazards, its own set of problems, its own set of concerns. There's occupational hazards with almost everything. Uh, if you're a gardener, there are. If you're somebody that washes windows in a high-rise. If you're a member of a SWAT team or a captain in, in the Army. Maybe even if you're a pastor, there are occupational hazards that come with every, every job out there. But what about the job of servant? I mean, if you're thinking like a servant, if you're forgiving like a servant, if you are influencing like a servant, can there be any problems with that? If I am trying to serve God, if you are trying to serve God in the community, shouldn't you be free of problems? Shouldn't it just go smoothly? After all, you're trying to do what God would have you do. Shouldn't it be smooth? But the second chapter of or the second Corinthians um, talks about this in chapter 2. Paul asks, who is adequate for these things? Who is adequate to be a servant? And then he says, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. So, we have sufficient ability to serve God if we are get, if we've given our heart to Him and we want to serve God. For him. But on our own, as ourselves, we are inadequate to serve. So let's look at some misconceptions about servants. One would be the ideal servant has special powers within. Him. Special powers. Now, maybe you have had somebody that's been important in your life that helped bring you to the Lord, that has prayed with you and read scripture with you, and maybe you held that person on a little bit higher level. Maybe you put them on a pedestal of sorts. And the Bible would, would encourage us to not do that, that we all are the same, that we're not to hold somebody up higher. Nobody is a bionic Christian or has supernatural ability. Some people might seem angelic, but really the only angelic portion of them would be the part of them that they have given to God and God uses through them on their own. They are not angelic. I remember in grade school, the first time I saw one of my teachers in a grocery store, I freaked out. Oh my God. I thought they lived in the school, showered in school, wore the same clothes. I mean, the teacher had different clothes on. I was like, I can't. They're real. These people are real. And you know, it was interesting when I came here, People that would only come to church on Sunday would see me in a tie and or a robe. And then they'd come on a Monday or a Thursday. And they'd see me in shorts and maybe a t-shirt. they go, are you? He's the same guy that, you know, it, it would just, you know, but I live in Florida, I'm supposed to wear shorts, right? No, and they support on that, except for Reverend Jackson. Who, no, you don't know, you wear shorts. But, other, but I won't wear them up here, right? No shorts up here. 
But that's what we do. We end up putting people into a level where, you know, I am just a regular guy who happens to be called to the ministry like you might be called to what you do. And we are all called to be servants in whatever vocation God has called us to. And so we don't have to hold people uh, at this level of being a super power, super angelic. So the second misconception is servants don't struggle with everyday problems. I'm a servant. I don't, I don't have the problems that you have. So I'm a servant. God takes care of me. I don't have those problems. You, you servants out there, right? No problems. Right? Kids never call you with problems. You never get sick because you're a servant. That's a misconception because we do go through all of those things. Paul, again, in 2 Corinthians says, we are hard-pressed. We serve. Are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. So let's take out the but-nots. If you take out the but-nots in this, what you'll find is servants are afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, and struck down. That's why there aren't a lot of servants. Because when you sign up for that occupation, when you want to be a servant, when you say, yes, Lord, I want to be a servant because it's going to make me have a great life. No, you read the wrong pamphlet. Because the pamphlet that says the, if you want to be a servant, you're going to have to take on a life that's afflicted, perplexed, persecuted, and struck down. What do those words mean? If you're afflicted, you're going to feel pressure from every side. As a servant, you will, be, you will feel pressure from every side. And a lot of that pressure will come from circumstances that where you're antagonized, maybe even by other believers. For sure, those you're trying to serve. You'll feel squeezed. You'll feel pressed. And it's going to make life hard. You're going to be perplexed. Now, the Greek word perplexed is without a way. You're going to be, feel sometimes like you just don't know which way to go. I'm a servant. I should. Yep. You're going to sometimes know which way to go. In fact, a synonym for perplexed would be lost. Sometimes, as a servant, you're going to feel lost. And maybe, maybe you think, well, if I, if I just can stay close to God, maybe I'll get to this spiritual plateau where I won't be perplexed. Sorry. You probably won't get to that plateau because it doesn't exist. Persecuted. Set to flight. Pursued. If you're pursued where you want to run, set to flight. If you're a servant, there's going to be times you feel like you're being chased and driven off and driven away. I'm supposed to serve over here. Oh my, they hate me. I'm supposed to serve here. They don't want me there. They're chasing me away. They don't want to hear what I have to say. You're being a servant. And struck down, shoved down, overtaken, run over. Remember the Steven Spielberg, the first Steven Spielberg movie in 1971 was The Duel. Anybody remember that? It was about a tanker truck that was chasing a car. Dennis Weaver was driving the car. Remember that? Okay. And the whole movie was this tanker truck chasing this car. I mean, through mountains and through, you know, they were in the middle of nowhere for hours. And this truck stayed right on the side. Sometimes almost going to knock them off a cliff. But the truck kept pursuing. Well, if you're, if you're a servant, you're going to feel pursued like the tanker truck is on your tail pursuing you, chasing you, trying to run over you. That's what a servant, that's what happens to a servant. You can feel that way. Third misconception. That servants are protected from subtle dangers. We're protected. Isn't it great? The big dangers were probably all susceptible to big, but the little dangers, I'm good on. I don't get a cold. I don't get sore throats. I never get a temperature because I'm a servant. Right? Does it work that way? No, that's the that's the misconception that we have. We always carry around our body, in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed. For we who are alive always being given over to the death for Jesus' sake so that His life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us. Why? Because life is at work in you. That's the life of a servant. Paul wrote that. 
And Paul lived his mature adult life in the jaws of death every day. <coughs> he had a lot of those servant issues we're talking about. So now, we read from 2 Kings, the story of Gehazi. 300 years had gone, and Israel had never had a king that walked with God. So, when you don't have a king that walks with God, your people don't walk with God. And so, because the people had rebelled and were living a life of immorality and murder and theft and doing all kinds of things that would be against God, God had to send a prophet. And He did. And the prophet, you would hear Elijah. Oh yeah, Elijah. He was raised up. But Elijah had a protege. And that protege was Elisha. So it's E-L-I-J-A-H, E-L-I-S-H-A. Elisha. Elisha's servant, his helper, was God. Now, Elijah had learned a lot from Elijah. In fact, he got a double dose of uh, Elijah's spirit because he was with Elijah when God called him heaven. And so Elisha, Elisha went from town to town prophesying. And prophets, that's not always a great, great job. Most people don't like what you've got to say. Because you're telling people that don't walk with God, they need to walk with God. Anyway, he would come to this area called Shunman. S-H-U-N-M-E-N, Shunman. And there was a woman in Shunman that would always take care of Elisha. Always have him stay there, would make his meals. And he really appreciated what he would do for her. But she recognized him as a man of God. So he and Gehazi would stay there. And they would do their prophecy work and they would move on. Well, when they left one time, the Shunammite woman said to her husband, we need to do something for this man of God. We need to build a room on our house. So that he has a nice place to stay when he's here. So that he can use this as space. He'll have a bedroom. He'll have a desk where he can write. This would be, we need to do that. And what did the good husband do? He built a room on it. Come on, guys, you need to be quicker than that. He built a room on the house. So next time, Elisha and Gehazi come through, they have a place to stay. Elisha feeling so, I mean, just so indebted to her. Says, we need to do something for her. What can we do for her? Because she was fairly wealthy. I mean, think about it. They go to room on their house here. He says, well, the Hazi says she doesn't have any children. Maybe we could ask God to bless her with a child. Elisha says, God is going to bless you with a child. No, don't want a child. No, don't, don't want a child. No, because I know I've been, I've had trouble having children. I'm not to have children. God God's going to let you with children. Next time I come through, you'll have a child. Sure enough, he comes through the next time, and she has a son. Well, some time goes by, and the boy gets older. Old enough where he's running and, uh, and helping his father, helping his mother. And one day, he runs out into the field with a splitting head of eight. He feels like his head's going to explode, and he passes out and looks to be dead in the field. The father calls the mother, she picks him up and takes him to the room where the man of God stays and places him on the bed where the man of God sleeps. And then she packs up and goes off to find Elisha. Gehazi, now trying to be the, doing things right, trying to keep people away from Elisha, sees her coming and says, no, you don't need to come here, Elisha's busy. Elisha sees what Gehazi is doing and says, no, let her come. She's in need. So he, she tells him what happens. And my son has had this headache and he passed out the field. I think he's dead. I put him on your bed. So Elisha sends Gehazi ahead. Take my staff. Run ahead. Get there as fast as you can. Don't stop and talk to anybody. Scripture says, don't stop and talk to anybody. Rush there and lay your staff on him and pray. And Gehazi, as a good servant, he does that. The Shunammite woman and Elisha follow behind. Elisha does as he's told. He gets there. The boy is laying cold on the bed. He puts the staff on him. And nothing happens. And he leaves the room. He goes out and he meets Elisha and the Shunammite woman and says, 
The boy has not awakened. Elijah comes into the room, tells the mother and Gehazi to stay outside. And he takes his body and eye to eye, mouth to mouth, hand to hand, lays on top of the boy. And he goes from cold to warm. And he awakes. And Elisha, because of the power of God that has raised him up, calls to Gehazi and says, tell the woman, the boy is alive. So Gehazi now turning and a little bit bittersweet. I wanted to be the one to raise him. I do everything for Elisha. This was my chance. Why didn't I get to raise him? She tells the Shinoite woman he's alive and she comes in and takes her son. Let's go some years forward now to where we are in Second Kings. Naaman, Naaman is this king who, here's how he's described in the beginning of the fifth chapter. Now Naaman was commander of the army, the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master. Highly regarded. Because through him, the Lord had given him victory. He was a valiant soldier. That's, that's pretty nice, isn't it? That's a pretty nice bit of scripture about you. And then there's four words at the end of the first verse. But he had leprosy. He was ostracized. People wouldn't associate with him. This highly regarded, victorious, valiant, valiant soldier has leprosy. So he hears that there's somebody that can heal him of his leprosy. It's the prophet Elisha. So he goes to Elisha. And Elisha hears that this king is coming to be healed of leprosy. And what do you think? You think Elisha goes right down there and brings King, yeah, come on, get down on your horse. I'll take care of you. Great, welcome. Glad you're here. He never even leaves his room. What's he do? He sends Gehazi down, of course. Gehazi, give him this message. Go down and tell him he needs to wash in the River Jordan seven times. And he'll be healed. How do you think the valiant soldier, highly regarded king, feels about a servant coming to give him the message. Hmm. He's not too happy. I deserve uh, the prophet. I deserve the top guy. And Gehazi goes down there and gives him the message. At which Naaman gets, just gives him all kinds of problems. The wrath of the king falls on Gehazi. Why do I have to go to the Jordan River? It's farther away. It's dirtier. There's a cleaner river here. Why do I have to do it seven times? Why can't Elijah come down here and talk to me? Why do I not worthy of Elijah? Why are you here? Gehazi's like, I'm mean, just a message. I mean, just seven times. And Naaman's men convince him to go and do that. And Gehazi again is like, wow, I didn't deserve that. I didn't deserve that. Gehazi has also decided to make a meal, some stew, for a large army. And the gourds he put in the stew, he didn't realize had turned. They were poisoned. And some of the people that tasted the stew got very sick. And of course, who came to the rescue? Elisha. He throws some meal over the pot, and it all turns great. And once again, Gehazi is the one that didn't, wasn't able to get any credit. And Elisha gets the credit again. Well, that's where we are as servants. We sometimes have the Gehazi syndrome in us, don't we? We have problems. We have problems with the way we are treated. And we have problems with the way people treat us. One of the problems of being a servant is of feeling used and unappreciated. We do all this servant work. And we need to have a little bit of credit. We need to get a little pat on the back. We have this Gehazi thing that says, you know, I do everything Elisha asked me to do. I do everything he asked. And the, when I put the staff on the boy, he didn't know it. I do everything for Elisha. And of course I would pick the poison gourds. I do everything for Elisha. And he won't accept gifts from King Naaman. I feel underappreciated. It's just not 
right. Sometimes you have to give a message that allows you to receive undeserved disrespect. He tells them to wash. He gives them God's message. Wash in the Jordan River seven times. And all he hears is how horrible that is because Elisha didn't come and talk to him. So they give him a hard time. They give Gehazi a hard time. He gets this undeserved disrespect. Sometimes that happens to us. Well, Gehazi decides to take care of that. So Naaman is healed. Naaman offers Elisha all these gifts, silver and gold and clothing. And Elisha says, what? No, I'll have none of it. God did this. Take it as a blessing from God. Be off. And so Naaman and his crew leave. Who hears that there's some gold and silver and maybe some new clothes? Gehazi. And he decides, you know, maybe Elisha doesn't, but these sandals are about five years old, and the strap's broken, and my robe is torn, and I'd really like to have some new duds. I think I'm going to follow Naaman and get some of that stuff. And that's what he does. He follows Naaman, he calls his name, and then he does what we like to do. He does a little name dropping. Naaman, Naaman, Naaman. Yes, yes, what, what do you need? Elisha sent me. What? Elisha sent me? Oh, great, okay. Um, he's reconsidered. He wants some things, maybe some of that silver and clothing. Uh -huh. In fact, I have a couple servants that need them. So he gives them clothing, and he gives them talents. Now Gehazi comes back. And now Gehazi, think about this. This is a man of God, a man who's performed miracles, a man who walked with Elisha, a man who you know walks with God, and when Elisha says, where have you been? What does he say? I haven't been anywhere. So because of Gehazi's hidden greed, he wanted to be recognized. He wanted to be the one that got the credit. And he wanted to be the one that got the prizes because he deserved them. After all, he's a servant. He's been doing this great work. Doesn't he deserve it? <clears throat> Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when this man got down from the chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or accept clothes, all the crows, vineyards, flocks, herds, men servants, and maid servants? The leprosy that Naaman was healed from will come to you and cling to you and your descendants forever. Then Gehazi, the servant who had been many, many places with Elisha, had seen miracles happen, who was part of many, many great things, went from Elisha's presence, and he was leprous. He was as white as snow. Four problems for the servant. Sometimes we decide that we can only be a servant in this territory. And if we're the servant in this territory, nobody else can be. This is my area. We're not supposed to simply serve in a particular area and possess it and jealously guard it. That's not what a servant does. That's a problem for a servant. Another problem is feeling used and unappreciated. Sometimes it's caught giving the message of God, the message that God wants given, and what you receive is undeserved disrespect. Sometimes that's what happens when you're a servant. And sometimes you'll be caught up in your own read. I felt unappreciated. I've been disrespected. Someone's come into my territory and has been doing some work, some servant work that's mine, and I haven't gotten anything for it. I think it's about time I get mine. Those are the problems of a servant. So you have to be motivated honestly to be a servant from the heart, not in words, not just in actions, but from the heart. God judges us from the heart. We can do great work, but if our heart isn't in the great work, we can give lots of money, but if our heart isn't into the giving of the money, keep it. God doesn't need heartless giving. God doesn't need heartless servitude. So when you're going to be a servant, ask the question, why am I doing this? 
Why am I in the position to be able to do it? And why am I helping this particular person? I don't think God calls us to be spectators. I think God calls us to be participants. One of the worst things that happened in the church were these wooden pews. So in the 1500s, people, before that, they people used to stand in service and be active in service. Now we come and sit and watch and want to be entertained. And sometimes we get to, in, enough, in a comfortable enough position, we can actually sleep through it. We got an extra hour of sleep today, and, and there's people sleeping. You know, Enoch was a man that is said that he walked with God. Well, that's too simple. What Enoch did every day was everything in his life, everything in his life was secondary to his walk with God. Not on Thursday I've got a meeting. Uh, Tuesday, oh, I've got this. Everything in his life was secondary to his walk with God. I suspect that he's probably in heaven now really close to God. Because I think God likes walking with people. And Enoch has proved that's what he does. He, he forsook everything to walk with God. He participated. Servants participate. Servants participate and they're not immune to problems. Servants participate and they're not immune from the, the temptations of life. Servants are not immune to any of the problems that non-servants have. Now, if you want reward, the greatest rewards you get in this life are if you're a hypocrite. So if you want to be a hypocrite, you'll have a better life. Here. I don't think it'll be so good when you leave here. But here it'll be pretty good. Because you're not held accountable to anything. But if you want the life eternal, you want to choose to be a servant. And you want to work through the problems that come with serving. Now, next week, if you've decided, I'm going to think like one, I'm going to forgive what, like one, I'm going to end the influence like one, I'm going to put up with the problems that servants have. I'm going to do that. Then next week is being obedient. Obedient. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we thank you, God, for this time that we can share, this time that we can be together in the community of faith. And now, bless our time in Holy Communion. In Jesus' name, Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you.